Welcome to The Climb! It's a show dedicated to helping singers, songwriters, and indie artists like you create leverage in the music business. We want to put you in a better place. And if you're clever, you'll realize that C-L-I-M-B stands for creating leverage in the music business. Oh my gosh, we're brilliant. Uh, let me introduce you to my co-host, Brent Baxter. Brent is an award-winning hit songwriter with cuts by Alan Jackson, Randy Travis, Lady Annabellum, Joe Nichols, and more. And he helps songwriters turn pro by teaching the art, the craft, and equally as important, the business of songwriting. And you can find Brett at songwritingpro.com, songwritingpro.com. And I would like to introduce you to my co-host, Johnny Dwinell. Johnny owns Daredevil Production. It's an innovative artist development company. They help you find your sound, and they help you find your audience. Not only do they develop and improve your artistry, they also grow and monetize your fan base, creating cash flow, baby. Because cash Dare- is king. <laughs> Daredevil has worked with multi-platinum artists like Colin Ray, Tracy Lawrence, Ty Herndon, and Andy Griggs. Just To name a few, you can find Johnny at DaredevilProduction.com. That's production, singular, no S. Why? We all know why. Because, ladies and gentlemen, there's only one Johnny Dwinnell. They had to break the mold. They just had to. All right. I'm a lot of things. What I'm not is worthy of making another one. There you go. There you go. uh, I'm self-deprecating. There you go. Uh, How you doing, brother? Man, I'm doing all right. I'm doing all right. I'm, I'm excited that I get to kind of coast on this one because it's a Johnny episode. And if y'all listen uh, week in, week out, which we hope you do, and we thank you if you do, then you know that Johnny and I take turns. We switch out one week I lead, one week he leads. And this is a Johnny episode focusing more on music marketing and music business, that kind of stuff, whereas I usually handle more of the songwriting, the songwriting business part of it. So, Right on. And we, by the way, thank you to everybody that listens. We are quickly approaching 15,000 downloads. And um, if you like what you hear on this, please share it. It's important that you spread the wealth, spread the knowledge. We try to keep it as entertaining as possible and and, and pack as much information as we can into 20 or 30 minutes that that is going to be valuable to you. Leave a comment or a rating and review on iTunes as well uh, so that other people, they're they're not going to care what we say as much as they're going to think and care about what you say. That's so right. Let us know there. So today, let's just get right into it. We got a lot of ground to cover. I okay? know. Uh, We're going to tackle really. Uh, listen, I'm gonna, we're going to go down ten music marketing facts. We're going to talk about ten different huge artists that you only know because they're famous, and we all sort of covet the survivors. We covet the people who make it, and mm-hmm. we we fantasize about them, and we tell ourselves stories about how they got there and and how easy it was. But I want to shed some light on some really masterful superstars that did not get where they got easily and and, mm-hmm. and and sort of pull the curtain back so you can see what really went on. And the survivorship bias, there's a great uh, article on this, by the way, I'm going to try to cover this as quick as I can, but there's a dude back in the 40s who made, who's a brilliant mathematician who, with a super high IQ, and he worked for the government in think tanks, and he was the guy that could tell exactly how to aim your torpedoes in World War II if the ship was turning, right? Because they could tell how mm-hmm. fast the ship was going by the waves and mm-hmm. do the math on that, but if a ship was turning and they needed to know where to aim that torpedo to make sure they could hit that German ship in World War II, he, he's the one that figured out how to do it and they had a problem with the bombers of the b-29 super fortresses and they because you had about a 50 percent mortality rate 50 percent five yeah, zero if you good. flew those things because they were flying tanks essentially easy to shoot down out of the sky and they were trying to figure out what to do well all the generals would talk to him and say hey you know these 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 planes are coming back and they got holes here 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 and here so that's where we're fortifying <laughs> the plane and he's like well you're doing it wrong and they're like what are you talking right. about he's like you're looking at the survivors if that plane has holes here 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 and there you don't need to fortify that they can survive they can survive they made it back we need to find out about the planes that went down like what happened behind the curtains and because that you couldn't just fortify the whole plane 
because it wouldn't be take too off. heavy. It would be and, too heavy. Yeah. yeah. And and uh, so there was all kinds of aeronautic sort of engineering involved. But that was the deal. Like, what happened to the planes that didn't make it back? So we're always looking at the famous people. You, if you want to open up a restaurant, you always look at the restaurants in town. You're like, man, it sounds so romantic. I want to get my own restaurant. I'm going to da da da. But maybe you don't realize that 90% of the restaurants in your area fail. That's right. And, and so really what makes the one work and that's why i want to explain to you these 10 facts from 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 big time artists on and their marketing facts so that you know what's going on uh and so right. consider them it, it this is what these these artists had to do to go through to make it okay so number one uh guns and roses appetite for destruction classic, okay? classic. what a great record mm-hmm. it came out in 1987 uh, October of 1987. They, uh, it was on Geffen Records, and Tom Zutau was the A and R guy, and the record did not quote unquote break until a full year after it came out. They were wow. about to be dropped from the label. They could not get the band on the air. That none of the radio promo that they did worked. Mm-hmm. It just nobody got it, and Tom Zutau was bought in he really believed in the band and uh he he thought that um the marketing machine wasn't getting the traction they wanted partly because mtv refused to play the first single so uh, this is at the end of the rope where they're and it, you talk to to some of the guys like my friends in winger uh you know nikki six stuff like that he'll he'll they knew guns and roses they were all hanging mm-hmm. out and they're like you know how's it going man did you lose your deal yet no not yet you know like, we're still hanging in there like <laughs> right. I mean, that's that's where this was at and so Tom Zutau went to David Geffen, who's a super mega mogul, and said, man, mm-hmm. um, you know, w- do me a favor. Like, pull, I need a big favor. Pull up and throw some weight around and get them spun on MTV. And so that's what mm-hmm. happened. They spun Welcome to the Jungle at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday morning, which is late Saturday night. The phones yeah. lit up. And, um, and finally... They, then they became a staple, and that's the way that happened. But they almost lost their deal before that happened. Wow. Good thing their fans were up at 3 a.m. on a Sunday morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Their fans are up at 3 a.m. Doing, doing exactly morning. what they were doing, smoking crack and, you know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. facing on the TV. Number two, Van Halen. Um, Van Halen recorded a, a demo that was passed on by every single record label twice. Gene Simmons got into this band, really liked Eddie, really mm-hmm. liked what they were doing. And so not only did they have a demo that was passed by every record label twice, but Gene Simmons produced that demo. And at the time, in 1976, um, that was, I mean, Gene Simmons was. He was a rock huge. god. He was huge. <laughs> huge. Yeah, huge. Right. And uh, so he produced and shot the demo. And, uh, and it, by the way, everybody in his camp, including his manager, um, was like, these guys are never going to make it. This is the worst thing you could ever do. This is, by <laughs> the way, straight from Gene Simmons' mouth, okay, on an interview that I read. And um, and uh, and so he, they didn't do it. And, and you know what happened? Gene thought, okay, he just gave the record and all the deal that he had gave it back to them he tried to convince mo austin and ted templeman who was the vp of a and r at that time of and also a producer at uh warner brothers uh that the you know he should they should sign him they didn't want to see him they didn't care uh, i think ted templeman liked from the mouth of ted templeman he liked eddie he, he mm-hmm. knew that eddie was a genius didn't like david lee roth Do you know who he wanted to put in the band as a singer initially we talked who about could it before. be sammy hagar i know he went to Sammy go. Hagar in the band, which which ended up happening like ten years later, but right. uh, and sort of and sort of organically without the 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 interference of a record label. But um, uh-huh. that's what he that's who he wanted in the band, and um, but they stood together shoulder to shoulder and said, "No, this is what we're going to do." And actually, Ted Templeman and Mo Austin went out to the Troubadour in L.A. to see Dawkins play. Van Halen huh. was opening up for Dawkins, and uh, lo and behold, they saw him live, and then they got it. They're like, "Oh." Yeah, let's sign him. <laughs> and so that's how they got their deal. And of course, that first record is uh, arguably amongst every single rock artist's top 10 records ever because it changed mm. the world, you know, with a rubber yeah. and all that. Uh, so speaking of... So what we're seeing here is that the survivors, even the survivors are almost not survivors. They went through a ton of, guess what? Nose. Nose, <laughs> right. Nope, nope, nope. No, nope. And they kept pushing, they kept pushing, they kept pushing, you know. 
So uh, you gotta, you've got to stay in the game. You've got to stay in mm-hmm. the game. Even when everybody, even when the same person tells you no twice, it, mm-hmm. it's just no for now. <laughs> right. That's for right now. We'll come back around. <laughs> you wait right here. So exactly. um, speaking of Gene Simmons, number three, Kiss. I'm trying to rifle through these as best as we can. So uh, I, I'm appreciating your discipline. Thank Normally you, Normally a, a 10 on a list means it's a two-parter. We'll see what happens. I'm, I'm not trying to do it. Uh, so they were signed to Neil Bogart's Casablanca Records in 1973 and released their first effort, which was called Kiss, in 1974. That record failed to gain traction in the marketplace. They quickly came off the, ro- the road to record Hotter Than Hell, which was mm-hmm. also released in 1974. Like the first record was such a dud. Mm-hmm. And they're like, let's just release another one. So they came back. This is yeah. The second one, Hotter Than Hell, that record failed to sell well. Then Kiss, they pulled them off the road again to record the third release, which was Dressed to Kill, which contained rock and roll all night mm-hmm. and, and fared a bit better than Hotter Than Hell. But still, the third effort did not sell well. Same year. Okay. And at this point, Kiss and Neil Bogart's faith in the band and Casablanca Records, they were almost bankrupt. But they had done such a good job with their live show and the makeup and everything like that, that they were Mm -hmm. touring and be able to make money touring. Uh, They weren't selling records, but they were making money touring. So they had this Mm -hmm. other cash register that kind of kept them out on the road. And um, so they said, well, because they're touring and the live show is so good, let's um, why not do a quote unquote, you know, live record, which if you know from the stories of Kiss Alive. <laughs> the only hmm. thing that was live on the record was the audience. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was re-recorded, but, um, but they, uh, they released a live and, uh, you know, they, to try to get that live show on tape and it did exactly that and not only saved the band, but it saved Casablanca Records and, you know, hard work, perseverance and grit. And by the way, they weren't just faced with record sales. They, they found another way to make the money mm-hmm. and to keep themselves alive. They don't sh- see what I did there. there? And, and, and come back around again. So, um, you know, big, I mean, they almost, almost didn't make it, man. Okay. Right. Kiss almost didn't become Kiss, like the iconic group that they were. And if yeah. I'm not mistaken, by the way, I think that Neil Bogart, this might be wrong, but I think that Neil Bogart picked up the first record Kiss. He mm-hmm. bought that, I think, from Epic Records, who signed them, recorded the record, had it pr- printed, on pallets, ready to be shipped, shrink wrapped, ready to go on trucks and be shipped mm-hmm. all the record deals. And then one of the label heads was like, "What the hell are we doing? Like, this is like <laughs> the dumbest thing we could ever do. These guys are dressed up like you know Japanese kabuki makeup. Right. Dude. Like, what the heck? get out of this right now? Cut our losses." And I think he picked up that first record for a song, but you know, begun and then created the, the band, begun to believe in the band, and, and and the rest of it happened there. I believe that's true. Hmm. Um, so number four, George Michael. Mm -hmm. Um, So George Michael was a huge multi-platinum international star with the 80s duo Wham. Wham. Before he became George Michael, he was George Michael of Wham. And uh, they sold 25 million records. Now, I don't care who you are. 25 million records puts you. I think That's, when you cross over 20 million records, you go into big time star status. Oh, heck yeah. Superstar status yeah. where you're world renowned. So mm-hmm. here you have somebody that's famous already. Okay, mm-hmm. And we're all lamenting as independent artists, which is nobody wants to listen to us. And if they just heard my music and if I just got in front of the right person, my life would be great. He was already famous. He's like, I'm George Michael. I sold 25 million records. Right. right. And uh, and so he gets his first solo record, which uh, which is Faith. He gets the deal and he gets mm-hmm. the deal with CBS Records and Walter Yetnikoff. And, and this is uh, Walter Yetnikoff was the last sort of uh, a record label executive who really believed in the bands, like, and believed in the art, mm-hmm. loved the artists. He, he, he was, he was in awe of his artists. Okay. It wasn't all business for yeah. him. It was art for him too. And George Michael had what they called a key man clause in his contract. So mm. if anything happened to Walter Yetnikoff, his contract became null and void. Right. And he was, yeah, out. he could walk. He could walk. And uh, because he didn't trust anybody else to do it. So uh, he cuts, he, he comes out with Faith, which is, you know, you know, the, all the songs, you know, huge Father record, Figure, yeah, all that huge, huge record. That sold 25 million copies. So now George Michael's <laughs> 50 million copies. Okay. And then his second solo record, Listen, Listen Without Prejudice, Volume One, while he was recording that, which is, by the way, if you've ever heard that record, an, an epic masterpiece. I mean, it really is this sort of crowning, it, it's the, it, it's the, the apex of his creative genius. Like it was a really mm-hmm. good record. And uh, CBS Records was purchased by Sony. Mm-hmm. And as a result, 
Walter Yetnikoff was out. And uh, who was in? It was Tommy Mottola, who was former manager mm. for Hall & Oates. And mm-hmm. Tommy Mottola, now he, <clears throat> first of all, a New York Italian. So you got that going for you. You know, he's not, he, he doesn't use <laughs> words, right? He's all right. business. And he wants to make the Japanese happy. Okay. Mm-hmm. And so he's trying to get his artist to work for him. George Michael was one of them. And George Michael's like, screw you. I, you know, I'm, my contract's null and void. And so here you have a situation where a label, and at that time, this is the heyday of the music industry, the only the top 10% of the artists are making any money. So mm-hmm. late, CBS Records probably had 500 artists. There's only 50 of them that made any money. 450 wow. of them lost money. Mm-hmm. And they're saying, and, and Tommy Toll goes head to head ego head to head with george michael and sits on the record i remember coming across that record in a record store by accident huh and thinking how did i not hear about this and you know why you didn't hear about it because they didn't market it and that record sold something like four million copies Hmm. guys they didn't market it like he was famous and they didn't market it and it made a huge impact on the sales because tommy just thought i've got 500 artists you got one career i'm gonna sit right. on this i'm gonna screw you and then that's why if you watch those videos with freedom mm-hmm. um where he's got his jacket from the faith on, video catching yeah, on, on fire, fire and, and the song yeah. is about what's happening between him and tommy Matola, you know mm-hmm. for the boys at mtv and tommy wanted him to be in the videos and shake his little booty and he wouldn't do yeah. it so he's like you want beautiful people in the videos i'll give you beautiful people in the videos and freedom was <laughs> like six of the top supermodels at the time right yeah <laughs> and that was just his big middle finger to tommy Matola going isn't this what you want to sell the music man you know it was a classic head to head but guys marketing was the key there um so uh number five winger um, Paul Taylor is, is is a dear friend of mine, and Paul met Kip Winger when they toured together with Alice Cooper's band. And um, I remember Paul saying he he came out of a, a recording session one time, and, and Kip was there, and, and he was just playing some demos that, that Kip had made. And he was like, man, those are cool songs. He's like, oh, thanks. And he's like, you wrote those songs? And Kip was like, yeah. He goes, who's that singing? Kip's like, that's me. You want to write some songs? And Paul's like... Uh, yeah. yeah, like let's do this. <laughs> and so there it was. So you've got two guys that are well inside the industry at this point. They're famous mm-hmm. touring with Alice Cooper. And uh, and they had, the, and this, by the way, this band sold a lot of records, okay? And mm-hmm. um, they had the, the, these demos done and nobody would sign them. Nobody, mm-hmm. nobody cared until Bo Hill, a famous producer, said... Yeah, I heard that. Yeah, you guys want to do a record? He, he, he told, uh, he, I think it was Atlantic Records they were on. He told Atlantic Records, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. I'll, I'll, I'll produce him and then Atlantic signed him. Hmm. That simple. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't, it had nothing to do with the damn quality of the music. Yeah. It was a relationship. Somebody that knows, likes, and trusts them. That's right. Number yeah. six, Bruce Springsteen. Okay, this is one of my favorite stories. Bruce, Bruce is iconic, right? And and Huge. he recorded yeah. Greetings from Asbury Park, New Jersey, which was his first major label release for Columbia Records in 1973. It took him six months to hand in that record. They, he handed in the masters, and Clive Davis told him that he didn't hear any singles on that. And if you've listened to that record, Clive Davis was right. Okay, there was nothing that was like going to work on the radio, and so he's like, "I can't mm-hmm. promote it. You got to give me some songs that that to help me promote it." And he told uh, he told Bruce, he said, "Look, go back and write me two singles." And so Bruce went back under pressure with his record mm-hmm. deal on the line, mm-hmm. right, and wrote what he write, "Blinded by the Light," mm-hmm. <laughs> and "Star right. in the Night." Um, and uh, both of which were released as singles and didn't do that well for him. So he was critically acclaimed on the first record, but it didn't sell very many records. Mm-hmm. And it wasn't until 1977 when, and I think by that time he had released his second release, which was the E Street Shuffle or whatever that is, the Good, the Bad, and the E Street Shuffle. Um, which he was just starting to get it together then. This is we're still not we're still not up to. Um, Born to Run, you know, which yeah, was his... not big, full Bruce at this point. We're not point. full Bruce yet. He's still developing <laughs> right. as an artist, right? But yeah. uh, it helped because Man for Man released Blinded by the Light and did a, mm-hmm. and, and made it commercial. Like, he, yeah. he, he played with it and, and sort of turned into this, and it became a huge number one hit, which, mm-hmm. thanks to Man for Man, Bruce got to keep his deal, which probably, I'm sure, didn't hurt him opening up the purse springs for Born to Run. Right, And, yeah. and he had enough time to develop and become a student of the game and then and was really writing just undeniable songs at that point you know yeah 
So um, number seven, this is just kind of, I want to bring this up because it's a marketing situation, but Sony bought Columbia Pictures and CBS Records. Why did Sony, a, a, a maker of electronics, buy that stuff? Sony got screwed on the Betamax tape. So mm-hmm. if you're really young, you probably don't even know what the hell this is. But, you know, when right. they first came out with videotapes, Sony was the one that first came out with it. And it would, they developed it and they spent a billion dollars developing Betamax. Wow. And, and the competitor was um, Philips. And Philips was owned by Seagram, which was a huge multi... Seagram's also owned Polygram Records. They owned mm-hmm. a, a movie studio. They had all these different sort of entities under this, this multi-billion dollar conglomerate umbrella. Mm-hmm. Okay. And so the competitor to the Betamax was a VHS tape. Mm-hmm. Well, in the 22 Immutable Laws of Marketing, which is a book that I've read, the number one law leadership is better to be first in the market than to be better. And, <laughs> and so uh, Sony just created really, really good electronic products and innovated. And mm-hmm. uh, Philips did that too. But Philips all of a sudden, for the first time ever, I mean, when the when these tapes machines first came out, you before that you never owned a video. Yeah, you never owned yeah. a movie. You, you you didn't know you had to wait for TV to run it, and then right. you would watch and listen to the commercials, and you were forced to sit there appointment mm-hmm. television and watch it. And then when the videos came out, it was really awesome because then you could tape them, right? You could tape them oh, yeah, and edit out the commercials, yeah. and and or fast forward through the commercials, and that was like a really really big deal. But mm-hmm. then all of a sudden, for the first time ever, because the under the Seagram's conglomerate umbrella, Phillips had access to titles, movie titles. Mm-hmm. And so they just flooded the market with for the first time ever, you could actually own the movie without commercial yeah. interruption. It wasn't edited for TV with all mm-hmm. the swear words, the cuss words and everything. You could own it. And so everybody went and bought VHS machines because they could get VHS movies. Sony couldn't do it. And that's why Sony bought a movie studio and a record label to make sure that they had access to all the art and could control all the art that was coming out for whatever new thing Mm -hmm. that they invented. So, you know, it's important to know that, that, um, uh, you know, why these things kind of happen. It's a marketing thing, right? It's about Mm -hmm. who gets it first, you know, who's the first in the marketplace. That's why we spend a lot of time at Daredevil trying to help you find a lane, you know, because yeah. because if somebody's if you're you know if you're trying to be Jason Aldean and there's 500 guys trying to be Jason Aldean, that lane's pretty crowded. There's a lot of traffic in there. Exactly. Yeah. You know, but and we already got Jason Aldean. Why we need you? Exactly. Exactly. So number eight, uh, Aerosmith's mm-hmm. deal in 1991 with Columbia, they sign a 30 million dollar record deal with an eight million dollar signing bonus. Okay. Nice. Well, the band was still signed to Geffen Records, who resurrected them from the dead, and still owed them three releases. Hmm. Now, Columbia, okay. Aerosmith was originally signed to Columbia, so Dream On and Back in the Saddle, again, all those old classic hits from Aerosmith mm-hmm. were Columbia releases. And then okay. the new ones, which was Permanent Vacation and Pump and um, you know those subsequent releases were on Geffen Records. Mm-hmm. And uh, why the hell, I remember asking a buddy of mine who was deep in the industry, why would, why would Columbia Records give Aerosmith 30 million bucks and $8 million when they still owe three releases to Geffen? And those guys were crazy. Like, who knows? They're, they might not be alive tomorrow. Why are they spending right. that much money? How does this make sense? It's the catalog. It was the catalog. Sony owned the catalog. And if they didn't sign them back mm-hmm. to a deal, the catalog was going to revert back to the band. Ah. And so they need to pay to keep that. And the catalog, I mean, I have a, a dear friend who worked in licensing at Sony directly. And so I know for a fact that like when Just Push Play came out, mm-hmm. um, Aerosmith uh, had a commercial for a year that was running with Dodge with Just Push Play. Not a vintage song. Not Sweet right. Emotion, not Back in the Saddle again. A brand right. new song, and, and the band got $1.8 bucks for that song. And, nice. and a, each of them got a car from Dodge, whatever car they wanted. A brand new car. <laughs> nice. So that's, the, that's what that was worth, right? And then who knows what Nissan paid for Dream On, because mm-hmm. they had uh, something going on with the Nissan 6 there. So that's why they did it, because they wanted to keep that machine going, because the catalog was worth money and kept it going. They didn't yeah. care whether the band lived or died. They were just yeah. like, we can work this this project here. So 
That brings us to uh, number nine. We're going to make Home it through stretching. 10, dude. This yeah. is crazy. Def Leppard's Hysteria. So mm -hmm. Def Leppard got their deal released on through the night. And then on their second release, which is High and Dry, they got Mutt Lang to produce it. And that great mm -hmm. record, by the way. And, and that sold about 250,000 copies on the strength of bringing on the Heartbreak, which became like a pretty big... Uh, radio hit and also mm -hmm. uh, right, that was right when uh, MTV came out so early on they were the darlings of MTV bringing on the heartbreak was a big regular rotation video mm -hmm. on MTV um, <clears throat> so then they go into the studio record Pyromania which was a history making and a history changing record like the production on that was so slick and so cool. I'd never been heard before. People yeah. freaked out, you know? Mutt Lang, baby. Mutt Lang. What a great record that was, too. I saw that tour, man. Not for nothing. That was sick. <laughs> that was sick, dude. At Alpine Valley. Like, oh, my God. And, um, and listen, they made enough money to satisfy the debt to the label for all three records, and they made a really nice profit because that record sold some ungodly amount of copies. The band sure, yeah. made a lot of money on Pyromania. And uh, they were wanting to move away because Mutt Lang is, is a taskmaster. He's very, mm -hmm. um, he, 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 I mean, he'll have you do something over and 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 over again. He squeezes the soul kind of right out of it, they say. Right, yeah. But that's how he makes the pop records that he makes, you know? And mm -hmm. they didn't want to do that anymore. So they hired Jim Steinman, actually, to produce Hysteria. Jim Steinman co-wrote and produced Bad Out of Hell with... Meatloaf. Meatloaf, yeah. And if you listen to that record, it's a much more sort of man. Let's just get some guys in a room. Let's let's play some music. We'll get some good performances. Mm -hmm. We'll work them up, and then we'll release the record. It's yeah, not the way Def Leppard was produced. <laughs> and at one point, um, Mutt Lang, because by, by the way, also Mutt Lang, not only did they want to get away from him, but he wasn't available for like a year or something like that. Like he yeah. was booked out a year, and and they were because he's know, like doing ACDC and yeah. who knows who else. Right? Exactly, exactly. So. Um, they were, uh, you know, they were saying, here we, you know, we got to, we, we got to get the record out now. And uh, Steinman starts recording the band. Mutt Lang happens to walk in the studio and hear, heard what he was doing with the drums, which mm -hmm. wasn't the samples that they were using on the records with those big, you know, the big drum sounds. Yeah. And just was like, what the hell are you doing? You're going to ruin this band's career. And so he mm -hmm. basically convinced the band to fire Steinman, which <laughs> they did. And he, he had a $2 million price tag, which they paid. Wow. Okay. And then they had to pay Mutt. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they paid two producers to make one record, both top producers at the time. And by the time they released that record, um, they had to sell 5 million records just to break even. Wow. Okay. And in between that, by the way, drummer... Uh, gets in a car crash with the Corvette, loses his arm. Not a good thing for a drummer? Not a good thing for a drummer. They're like wondering what the hell they're going to do, but they stood behind him. And mm -hmm. that kid, that kid, he went in and, and, and learned how to freaking play drums with three hands and samples. Three hands? I'm sorry, with three <laughs> limbs. Three limbs. Two legs and one, and one hand. Okay. We're going wow. the other way. So you talk about grit. I mean, all this stuff happened. Think about what happened. And, and they were selling really good on the first single and the second single, but it wasn't until Pour Some Sugar On Me came out, which, by the way, last song handed in in the 11th hour on the record by Mutt Lang. Okay. Yeah. And um, I almost didn't make the record. And so here's the deal. If you think when you get your deal, if you think when you're famous, if you think when you've sold 20 million records that you can kick your feet up, stretch mm -hmm. out, coast. light up a big old cigar and coast, you're wrong. The right. dice are always tumbling. So um, keep that in mind. And finally, number 10 is Michael Jackson. Um, yeah, I've heard of this guy. He's uh, yeah. He, he he just. I mean, he did, dances real good. I heard he sings real good. Writes some songs. You know, I he's think a kid singer, right? Kid singer. I think. How many records yeah. has he sold? By the way, like it, all of them. Uh, yeah, all of them. Every single one of them. I mean, I think it's well over like 150 or 200 million records worldwide. Worldwide. Yeah, probably. Yeah, it's insane, right? Yeah. So Michael Jackson was world famous uh, as the front person for the Jackson Five. Mm -hmm. And here's the storyline. Epic didn't want to sign him when it was time for well, Michael the to do a solo. Yeah, why would you? He's just uh, Michael Jackson. It's Michael, I mean, this guy's so freaking <laughs> talented, right? Like, I mean, right. he's so talented that the engineer created a box for him to stand on because he dances while he sings in the studio, cutting vocals, and it's on time. So they recorded <laughs> it and mixed that crap in all those songs on. On, on on all the Michael Jackson records. I mean, that's how on the money that this guy is. He's a freak of nature. He was so good. Mm -hmm. Then marketing, 
VP of marketing, Epic, didn't want to sign him because they thought he was a novelty. They thought well, he's, he's okay. So freak talented. Already sold a bunch of records with the Jackson Five. Yep. Hours, 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 and hours of stage time. So he's, I mean, he's already way more experienced than someone his age usually is. Exactly. And they're saying no, thank you. And they're saying no. They're saying we don't want to do it. And I can't remember what happened for him to get the deal, but um, I mean, obviously the rest is history. But they thought that was going to be a bomb. And mm-hmm. Michael Jackson. Already famous worldwide. They had a cartoon out about him. I mean, like, it, yeah. I, I mean, how much more famous can you freaking get, right? All that <laughs> stuff going on. And he still had to fight. He still had to sing for his supper to mm-hmm. get that deal, people. Okay? This isn't easy. This isn't This isn't about being, you know, fame is not easy street. Mm-hmm. So if you're looking for fame, don't do it. You know, get into this game because you want to be here because you want to make good music and you're going to have to fight every single step of the way to make it happen. So, man, I hope those, you know, shed a little bit of light on that. You know, I'm I'm totally depressed now. Thank you. (laughs) Well, don't be depressed. I mean, just know that it's (laughs) you still got to work. You got to sing. Know what you're signing up for. Know what you're signing up for. Right. If Michael Jackson had social media back then, Mm -hmm. he at the age that he was at. I mean, he wouldn't, oh, yeah. he wouldn't have needed a damn record label. <laughs> he could have told the marketing guy to go stick it up his kazoo, and I'll take this my damn self and put it out and watch me sell right. you know, 10 million records on my own. Because, right, yeah. So now, you know, it's a lot easier now than it was before, but that's that's uh, that's all I got on that right there. That That is a ton. I can't believe it. we got through a 10-parter in one part. It's amazing. I'm proud that's, of We are like 45 minutes now? No, we're actually, we're, uh, we're doing good. We're at 31 Whoa! So wow. wrap it up so, quick, and I'll still be sh- shorter than your the last one. All, all right, all right. But that's because so, I talk all the time. Before we go, <laughs> <laughs> Johnny. Before we go, you have something you want to share with the audience, other than all this drama you've already shared with us. I do. Okay. So number one, the Twitter book. You know, it, you, listen. You're going to have to get good at social media. The best way to get good at social media is to start with one. Master Mm -hmm. one, spend the next three months mastering one social media platform and the rest of them will come very, very easily after that. Uh, But this is the one you got to do. And so it's Twitter. Start with Twitter. I got a free book. It's a best selling book on Amazon. I give it away for free at giftfromjohnny.com, J-O-H-N-N-Y, giftfromjohnny.com. And uh, it's a tour of the, the, the app. It'll tell you exactly how to work that platform, what every button is. I need to update it a little bit, which I'm going to do shortly. But um, you can figure it out, the, the, the changes. And it'll show you how to get a 1,000 targeted followers in every single month in just 15 minutes a day. So we show you the tools that we use and the strategies that we use so that you're not wasting a lot of time. We try to get you a jump start on that. And cool. the second thing is um, consulting. You know, if you're stuck a little bit and, and you're you're looking to take the next step and, and you feel like you're, um, your, your wheels are spinning, sometimes I always like to innovate my way out of that by learning something. I, I got a ton of books sitting on my desk that I have yet to read, a ton of books, mm-hmm. a stack of books that I already have read, and that gets my juices flowing. And it, sometimes that's even more potent when it's somebody going to take the time to to look at your exact situation. This is yeah. not something that's free. We, we do charge for it, but uh, it's, it's, it's not too expensive at all. And really, it, you'd be amazed at what we can do in one hour, but we'll look at every one of your social media platforms, your website. You probably don't have a web store, but if you do, I'll look at that too and let you know, here's what you got to do to kind of move ahead and start and start looking at the industry the way you need to look at the industry instead of chasing the idea that you're going to go make a demo and some major label is going to sign you based on your talent and develop you because that's just not the way it's going to happen. Right. There's a lot more to it than that. So thank you, Johnny. Thank well, you. Appreciate for the information. it. You got it, guys. Listen, we do this because we want you to win. If you like what you heard, please share it. Uh, leave a rating and review on iTunes. Uh, hit us up if you want us to, if there's something you want us to cover, hit me up at info mm-hmm. at daredevilproduction.com. Again, production is singular. There's no S. You, you never know. You might just, your idea might just become an episode of a podcast, okay? There you go. So let's see you do it. We'll keep on climbing. And we'll see you at the top. <laughs> <laughs>